Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, the Jenkins online meetup. My name is Alyssa Tong. I am a longtime Jenkins contributor in the areas of events and um, outreach. Today, we have a presentation by Uli Hafner on how he eases the complexity and increased ramp up time um, for Jenkins Environment Development, uh, Jenkins Development Environment Setup. His co presenters are um, Jean Marc Mason, Darren Pope, and Mark Waite. And I'll let our um, presenters say hello and introduce themselves. Hi, my name is uh, Uli Hafner. I'm a longtime contributor to Jenkins as well. I think it's almost 15 years now. And I'm the author of the warnings plugin, the Git forensics plugin, and yeah, a couple of more plugins I'm um, handling. Uh, in my re real life, I'm a, a professor for software engineering at the University of uh, Science in, in Munich here. And uh, I'm teaching students software engineering, software development, and so on. And I'm using Jenkins in my lectures uh, to show them how to improve the quality of their code. And this is the presentation we are talking about today. Thank you. And Hello, my name my name is uh, Jean-Marc Mason. I'm located in Brussels, in Belgium, and uh, I'm helping out on the Jenkins uh, uh, projects, uh, trying to help uh, developers. Uh, I've been for years senior DevOps uh, consultant and a long, long time uh, Jenkins user, even in the time of Hudson uh, in the beginning. Of that. Hi, my name is Darren Pope. I am a developer advocate for CloudBees and also co host a podcast with Victor Farsic called DevOps Paradox. And uh, I think Mark and I might end up talking about some of the things we did back in October today, too. We may. I'm Mark Waite. I'm the Jenkins documentation officer, and I'm um, been using Jenkins for a long time. I happen to also be one of the maintainers of the Git plugin, and I'm quite active in documentation and platform topics. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Mark. Um, so before we dive into the presentation, I would like to highlight a couple of things. Um, some upcoming events uh, for Jenkins. So in February, we will be hosting a, a Google Summer of Code 2022. If you'd like to be um, a part of this program, we are looking for um, organizers, mentors, project ideas. Uh, please reach out to us. I will leave a link in the um, comment window um, on the meetup page after this event. And um, we are, we're always looking for presenters for our next online meetup. So we're planning to have more of these to bring helpful content to our community. Um, so if you're interested in speaking, you've got a great story, please reach out to us. There's more um, on this um, at a later slide in this deck. In June, we are planning to be in Austin, Texas um, with CDCon, where we will host a Jenkins Contributor Summit. And again, if you have a great Jenkins story, the CFP is currently open, please submit your stories. Uh, September, DevOps World is the largest event for Jenkins, and this is taking place um, in Las Vegas this year. Again, we will have a contributor summit um, on site, and um, we want to give a shout out to our sponsors, CloudBees and the CD Foundation for hosting these events and allowing us to be part of their um, events. So Jenkins needs you. Uh, we are always in need of technical and non-technical volunteers. Um, this is how you can participate in some of the programs. Yeah, there's there's um, organizations for meetup. There's translations for documentations. Um, there's testing, coding, 
you name it. Um, we're always in need of volunteers. If you'd like to give back to the community, we'd be happy to have you. And it's also a great place to meet good people. The Jenkins online meetup, um, as um, I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a place where we hope to bring more Jenkins helpful content to the community. So if you have a story, please reach out to us. You can go to this link to find more about it. So before I hand things over to Uli to start the session, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded. We will post the link uh, in the meetup page after the event. Q&A, please put your questions in the chat window throughout the presentation. Our presenters will get to them um, throughout the presentation. And lastly, our code of conduct is fully enforced here. And if you don't know what that is, simply being kind will do the job. So at this time, I'll hand it over to Oli. Thank you. And I will pin my video so we see me in the full screen mode. So uh, what is this talk about? Uh, I want to talk about uh, the development environment I'm using uh, for my students uh, to yes, continue and start development in Jenkins. So as already mentioned in my introduction, I'm using Jenkins to show yeah, the students how to do continuous integration, continuous deployment. But I'm also using Jenkins in my courses to see how an actual yeah, software application works, how you develop the code, how you develop the tests and so on students can use this code to, to improve their skills and we have also master thesis bachelor thesis or some kind of exercises which work with jenkins so the students can work with real code which with real code they can review and where they can produce their pull requests and we integrate these pull requests in jenkins as well in these courses it was a always a little bit difficult to start the course because typically the development environment of everybody is a little bit different. Some people use Windows, some use Linux, some use Mac OS. This is always um, kind of difficult to get everybody having the same uh, machine where we can start developing. So one first step, what we are doing at the university of applied sciences here in Munich is we hand out for each of our students a virtual machine with Linux. And this virtual machine is not part of this talk now. This is a kind of yeah, precondition. We give everybody a virtual machine which has Ubuntu Linux installed and every yeah, tool you need uh, like Maven, Git is already pre-installed. So if you have Windows without Docker, it does not really matter. You get this virtual machine and then you can start developing. So this is for all of our courses. So this is nothing that comes from me. This is a colleague of mine is, is doing. And now I'm coming in and want to yeah, develop plugins for Jenkins or to yeah, show how Jenkins is working. That means I also need some kind of setup how to build Jenkins plugins, how to start Jenkins and, the, and, and see how these plugins actually behave. And this was a manual process in my first courses. And yeah, after doing this course again and again, I, meant, I noticed this is better if we have a setup which is easy to install on each uh, student's machine. Uh, this has also a good side effect. I'm using the same setup for uh, the contributors, a document of my warnings plugin and of the code coverage plugin and of the Git forensics plugin. So new contributors to my plugin also have the opportunity to have a good setup of things we need when we want to develop Jenkins plugins. And this is what I would like to show you a little bit in more detail today. So uh, the yeah, the topic is uh, this uh, GitHub project. Uh, project it is uh, yeah currently still in my personal account. 
uh, that's because I'm using it at the university and it's not uh, yeah, really from, from the Jenkins project. But yeah, uh, I'm not sure if uh, I should uh, give that in the chat. So if someone did not see it again, this is uh, the URL of, the, of this uh, development iron, uh, uh, this project. And this project basically contains all things we need for our development setup in Jenkins. So just a brief sketch uh, in the beginning. Um, Basically, this environment um, consists of uh, three things. And I'll switch now to my uh, screen. Then you will see uh, the project here in GitHub. So uh, in GitHub, we have this project and it co contains a lot of files, which are not so important. Uh, the important thing is so, yeah, the, in the beginning, uh, what actually is part of this development uh, setup and basically i have uh, three items which are required for students to begin the first thing is they need to know which is the actual code which plugins would we like to develop, to develop in jenkins so my students work not in jenkins core we are always heading to development of jenkins plugins so the first part with which my development uh, environment contains is a, a setup of all these plugins that are required for the students. Currently, these are the warnings plugin, code coverage plugin, the Git forensics plugin, and so on. We'll see it a little bit more in, uh, in a, a couple of minutes. And these plugins are automatically checked out, so the students do not need to worry where is the source code of the file. Uh, I have one script provided that checks out all these modules. These modules are currently just my module. So yeah, if you want to develop in the Git plugin, for instance, you need to change those scripts. But this should not be really hard to do. So this is the first setup. You get all the modules you need. Then I have a multi-maven project created, which compiles all these projects. And using these compiled projects, I've created an IntelliJ project, which everybody can import in his workspace. So they just need to click import in IntelliJ and wait a little bit until IntelliJ opens and indexed all files, but then you can immediately start developing. And the last part, which is quite important for Jenkins is that when you're developing plugins, you want to see the results of your changes. And these results are best seen not only in unit tests, but they are best seen in an actual running Jenkins instance. And therefore, I also packaged in this uh, development environment uh, and Jenkins installation, which is ready installed with a lot of plugins I'm needing with a lot of jobs which already use these plugins that the students will change. And finally, what is also a part of this installation is we have a Jenkins controller, which runs only the user interface. And we have a Jenkins agent, which runs the actual builds. Uh, this helps me to develop already for a um, complex installation where we need to have yeah, a distributed environment. And there are a lot of bugs coming if you are not testing it in a distributed environment. So this Jenkins installation, as you will see later on, will use one agent and one controller. Both are Docker containers, so they are installed on your local machine. But uh, there you have a, a good opportunity to debug your code in a distributed uh, Jenkins environment. So, Uli, you yeah. you just described what sounds like near Nirvana for me. So, as a as a plugin developer, you're providing a, a setup that that I can run Jenkins. It's already got an agent configured. It's already got interesting jobs configured. And yep. I could potentially even offer additional jobs to that as a pull request to your to your repository. Yes, this is possible. So 
I will show it now in, in more detail what these elements are. So this is just the uh, yeah, introduction to. So I think the best thing is I show you now uh, how you interact with all these three components. And then we see yeah, how you can use them yeah, if you want to contribute to Jenkins or how we can extend them if we need different modules than the warnings plugin. So the first thing you need is um, you need a, you know, a, a terminal where you can clone the code. Um, you, yeah, you can use a, a Git a user interface as well, but I'm typically uh, cloning the repository on the command line. So you can use the GitHub uh, console. For instance, here um, I'm, I'm checking out uh, the repository and cloning it on my machine. So this works with GitHub console, or you can use git clone, uh, yeah, and clone it and under a different name, let's say devenv, and then I'm cloning these modules. Um, that means after this clone command, I have this project, uh, which I described here from GitHub on my local machine, and then I can start to uh, build the project. So the first thing we need is the plugins we want to develop. So let's go to the um, folder. And let's see what we are in this folder. We yeah, have a lot of scripts, but actually not many uh, source code files yet because these source code files are not here. What I need is I need to transfer all files from GitHub to my local machine now. And I'm using a simple shell script to get them from GitHub. So I started using with GitHub uh, with Git modules, but that didn't really work out. So I'm just using a script and get all the modules of my plugins on my local machine. And Therefore, I have one uh, command which is called yes, uh, clone. Oops, sorry, uh, clone repositories. There is the possibility to use a, the Git. Uh, uh, yeah, if you have a Git key in GitHub, you can use got, get a clone repos shell script. Or if you only use HTPPS, uh, uh, you use uh, the different command. So both commands are supported. And if you uh, run this command, then I'm getting all the content you need uh, to start development. That means all modules or all plugins from GitHub. And if I press enter, then you need to see uh, there are uh, different clone steps uh, right after each other where we get from GitHub the source code we need uh, when we are going to develop the source code. These are now only my plugins. So if you need different plugins, you need to change these scripts. So conceptually, could I offer a, would you consider a long-term branch on your repository that might be dedicated to somebody else's plugin, like the Git plugin? Yeah, that might be a good idea, yeah. I'm not sure if it's possible to make it a, a parameterized. This is a little bit more work, but I think a different branch would be simple okay great thank you so you're and you're you're open to that kind of thing um, if if i wanted to propose such a thing you can mm -hmm. you and i could discuss it through pull requests and what yeah yeah great. that would be fine mm -hmm. so this is the first step now all my code is on my machine um, and now the code is will be compiled using a maven that means um yeah i press now enter and now uh, I'm using Maven a compile for this project. Um, this takes a little bit. It takes, I think, almost 10 minutes on my machine. So I'll stop it here. And I prepared it already for you uh, in, in another window. So I'm switching to this window where we are now finished. <laughs> so we saved a lot of time because you see it's uh, yeah, almost 10 minutes the build typically requires. And it's quite important to uh, start 
a full build of all these modules you need because I want to import this project now in IntelliJ. And here you see all the plugins I, I'm, I'm downloading. This was my coding style. It was the static analysis model, code coverage API, forensics API. So that's almost 10 modules, which are part of the setup I'm giving the students. And typically, we can make a smaller setup for individual people. For instance, like the Git plugin, we just need the Git plugin and maybe the Git client plugin. Um, I started with different branches for different uh, use cases, but I then considered it's easier for me to have just a single branch with all my plugins. And some students just use the analysis model plugin package and some only the warnings plugin. So yeah, it's just easier for me to have 10 modules here in, in one branch rather than having them individually. And so, so Uli, you yeah. always start from the sources. These are the plugins of interest. Do you need yeah. other plugins, a more statical one where you use the released one or you always uh, go from the sources? I'm always going from the sources because my courses are always about source code development. So we're writing tests or we're developing new functionality. So we need to have the source code. Uh, each of these source code has a lot of dependencies, of course, and they are automatically grabbed by Maven. And if I deploy these plugins in Jenkins, the depending plugins are also automatically pulled. So as we see later on, the Jenkins instance already has a lot of plugins because of the transitive dependencies. So after we compiled the source code, we can open the source code in IntelliJ. This is the next step. Uh, so we need to compile them in advance because in Jenkins, we are generating a lot of source code during the Maven process. And IntelliJ doesn't handle that quite well. Uh, if you start IntelliJ without generating the messages, for instance, or the assertions, et cetera. Therefore, it's important to make a build first. And then you can simply open the whole project in IntelliJ. When you open the project in IntelliJ, <clears throat> I don't know if you already used IntelliJ, then IntelliJ is indexing all files. The, it takes also a couple of minutes. So uh, what I have done is uh, I it start, started that step before the meeting. So we now have already the IntelliJ project open. So if you start this setup in IntelliJ, you see this a few. That means yeah, the readme on the right side. And on the left side, you see the tree of my projects. Um, you see here the analysis model, the code coverage plugin, my coding style. Um, yeah, this is something which is not related to Jenkins. Um, I'm using a coding style for all my development courses in where I define which check style warnings are relevant, which spot box warnings are relevant, how do I want to format the code. And I'm using it in Jenkins as well. So it makes sense that this project is also part of here of this uh, development environment. There are also a lot of uh, readmes and help content. It's only in German available right now because I'm using it for my students, how they write unit tests or how they should write inheritance classes and something like that. So this is also part of this project, but not related to Jenkins. And then you see here we have uh, all these projects and you can open these projects as you normally do. So this is uh, the first thing we have uh, in IntelliJ. We have all sources here. And what you need to notice is that all sources are currently uh, bound to my or, or, to tank, or to the Jenkins repository. That means not to your fork. So if you want to change code and create a pull request, you actually need to switch the remotes. So I'm not showing it here. How do you do, do that? So this is something yeah, you will get. It's not so complicated to change the remote. So 
that we that you you need to press it in github fork the project and then you can yeah change the remote mm -hmm. that means um in intellij uh, we have uh the opportunity to debug the code so you can open everything yeah let's say uh, warnings oops no. warnings uh Oh, it's a little bit slow, my computer. Let's see what we IntelliJ is finding. Actually, it's finding nothing. Okay, it's a little bit slow, my uh, <laughs> computer. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it is a Docker running in the background. Zoom is running in the background and the camera is running in the background. Uh, so yeah pretty still, busy yeah it's quite busy now i'm it's getting a little bit noisy so let's see why it is not open ah no okay so now the um a class is open so you can here start development and uh, one thing what students typically start with the development is they run unit tests and therefore uh, i provided a setup of uh, JUnit runners for the students. That means if I press the run dialog uh, in IntelliJ, you see that I have a lot of uh, unit test runners pre-configured. So for instance, if you want to run the unit tests of the analysis model project, you simply select here, and then you see here in the background, uh, the progress bar is starting, then all unit tests are automatically started. Uh, this helps uh, in the beginning to see yeah, where are the unit tests, how do I start them? So I already provided a runner in IntelliJ where you can use these, uh, where you can run these unit tests. And so these, yeah, these sorry. runners are provided in the topmost project that you yep. that you showed, correct? Okay. Yes, this is um I'm not sure if that's helpful. Maybe we can have a look here. So we have here an, an idea folder um, and we have some run configurations and here are all these run configurations are stored. Okay, great. Okay. This makes it quite easy uh, to enable code coverage how I would like to have it. And yeah, it's easier for students to start uh, if already is pre-configured. I can get and, finicky to get them working. Yeah. So I, I'll stop the test here uh, right now uh, and show you uh, the additional uh, runners I'm having. I'm having a runners uh, to run here all unit tests. And I am have, yeah, in, in the warnings plugin, uh, I split the unit tests in integration tests and unit tests because the integration tests are quite slow. So we can have the unit tests which take only a, one or two minutes and we can start the integration test separately which take i think 20 minutes so yeah you don't need to wait every time the next runner we have is um i'm not sure how interesting is that for everybody um all of my plugins have unit tests integration tests with a running jenkins instance but no user interface and then we have also a user interface test using the acceptance test harness of Jenkins. And these runners are also configured. That means if I run these uh, UI tests here uh, from this runner, then uh, a Firefox window will pop up and the UI tests will be automatically started. So, yeah. These UI tests, uh, I have one lecture which is about UI testing in Jenkins. And in this lecture, we use these runners very often because we want to test in Firefox and in Chrome how, yeah, uh, how we can start them and how they behave. And now, Uli, have you found have you found that UI testing is successful for your students, that they they find it productive and helpful? using these kind of techniques mm -hmm. 
Yes, um, I, I, I started with the acceptance test harness. This was a little bit complicated because we have a separate project where we have these separate uh, tests. But now I've integrated the user interface tests into the plugin itself. So these tests are part of the warnings plugin. They are part of the Git forensics plugin. And in this semester, we uh, have some more tests for the code coverage plugin and for the JUnit plugin. The pull requests are currently yeah, pending for my reviews, uh, but they are provided for other plugins as well. And this helps not only um, the students to learn how to make UI tests, it also helps because I'm using these UI tests during uh, the pull requests now. So if someone provides a pull request for the warnings plugin, for instance, if Jenkins core is bumping one version again, the next version, then I'm running all my UI tests and I'm looking if my UI tests or my code still works with the latest Jenkins version, for instance. Now that surprises me because there are many changes coming in the Jenkins UI even now. Mm -hmm. Have you had, has that been particularly disruptive for you or are you able to adapt? How is that, how's your experience been there? Um, the core changes are still work. Everything is fine. That's really good. Um, the only thing is the acceptance to harness breaks uh, or broke. So uh, I'm, I'm using an older version of the acceptance test harness, which is running fine. But this is the nice concept of uh, the Panda bot in, in a GitHub. So if there's a new version, I'll automatically get a pull request, which will be verified. And currently, the acceptance test pull request is broken, but the Jenkins core pull requests are still OK. I'm not sure if this will work again if we have this open pull request merge from uh, the UI changes, so I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, well, the thank people you. are taking their breath there. Yeah. Thank you for the work you're doing on it. Thanks very much. So maybe I'm not sure if we have time for the UI test to look into more into deep. Uh, maybe we can, can come to it a little bit later. So what I also want to show uh, what helps my students is um, yeah, maybe I need to show the Jenkins part first. Um, so we have a lot of uh, uh, runners here where you see Jenkins agent, Jenkins controller, uh, build and deploy uh, analysis model. And, and these runners are also useful, but in order to uh, show you what these runners are doing, I need to introduce the next topic uh, of my talk, which is the actual Jenkins instance, which I provided as well. So um, as already mentioned in the beginning, um, if you are using IntelliJ, yes, you can start the integration tests, UI tests, everything you can start, but you actually want to see your code in action in your Jenkins instance. So I created in this project uh, one additional folder. It's a Docker folder. And in this, in this Docker folder, I have uh, two uh, Docker files, one Docker file for the agent, which is currently running Java 11, and the Jenkins controller. These are quite simple Docker files, uh, which have been provided. I'm not sure, Mark, you are one of the contributors. And yeah, I, I use these files uh, in my setup as well. It is uh, the latest Jenkins version uh, with an Alpine image. And the agent is, uh, I think, yeah, a simple Java agent. And this Docker container, when you are starting it, let's head over or back to my scripts. So if you are here on, here are, we are already in the same uh, analysis, or in here's uh, the same as warning step setup. And here I already cloned the modules that are part of my setup. And here we have a script to uh, start this Jenkins, uh, which I'm using in my uh, demonstration. So mm, you can, well, this Jenkins is configured with Docker Compose, so you could start it with Docker Compose, 
but uh, it was uh, required that I need to make a little bit more uh, scripts around it. So I'm using Docker pull to get the latest uh, LTS or not LTS, sorry, I'm to get the latest uh, version of Jenkins every time I'm starting it. And then I'm using Docker compose and yeah, I need to set the yeah, user IDs correctly. So because of my Mac somehow it doesn't work right well. So just a simple script wrapper script around Docker. So if I start the script, um, then Jenkins uh, is starting. That means I'm getting the latest Jenkins version, then the build image is built. So if you are doing this the first time, it takes a little bit longer, of course. Um, I already uh, started that yesterday, so now everything is fine. And now Jenkins is starting. And this Jenkins, um, which is part of my environment, has all plugins I am using typically in Jenkins. That means there's a Git plugin, the GitHub plugin, and there are also these plugins I want to change, the warnings plugin, the code coverage plugins. So I think all plugins which are important. And also some plugins which are not actually important in an, a good instance, which we, I need some testing uh, plugins with where I can use for UI testing or where I can develop some artifacts. And it's very helpful uh, because I noted uh, students uh, take a lot of time to install a Jenkins version. Then one thing is not happening. Then they forgot some plugins. So here all plugins we need are pre-configured. And you will see now when it's uh, yeah, started, still is a little bit um, working, uh, then we can see uh, how this Jenkins instance behaves. So, so Uli, you've got the definition of this Jenkins instance inside that Docker directory, and yeah. it had all of the things that you need to define are there. The yeah. the job definitions, the yeah. everything, everything. So we have uh, this Docker file. This is uh, uh, yeah nothing special. Uh, I'm just installing the plugins. It's still the old script, but it it's, yeah. works. <laughs> So <laughs> never change a running system. Yeah. Uh, and in this plugins, uh, all my plugins are defined, which I'm using. Yeah. And I'm using Jenkins uh, mm -hmm. configuration as code uh, to set up this plugin, uh, this instance. And yeah, let's make it a little bit bigger. So here, yeah, what I also need, we, I need a connection to the agent because I already said I have a Jenkins instance with have an agent, uh, which is the second Docker image. So this is also a simple um, yeah, Jenkins agent uh, distribution. And the only thing which is a little bit um, strange for everybody, this is just, uh, I need to talk with the agent and the controller. Uh, I need to open debug ports as we will see later on. And therefore, yeah, the, the, we have uh, some a key cryptography, which is not actually a cryptography because the key is public. Uh, it's just in our develop setup. Uh, so you won't use it in a real setup. So everything is here in these Docker files. And when you start Jenkins, then you get, uh, let's see if it's really, no, it's still not here. Uh, sorry, it takes a little bit, but uh, this is a screen from uh, a couple of hours ago. And if you start this Jenkins, then you have not only conf, conf, uh, how is it called a job DSL plugin. I'm using the job DSL plugin to get five jobs into this Jenkins, and these five jobs are actually using my plugins again. So I see these plugins in action. Um, so this Jenkins has these uh, empty jobs now, and now you can the students can press the play button on each of these jobs and start everything. Playing with, experimenting with, with it. Yeah, right. great. There so, was a, a question, and maybe just interrupt here. 
this yeah. environment is a complete workbench with several plugins yeah. uh, 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 installed. Um, and, and the question asked by Mark, uh, Mark McCullough, uh, is that uh, are there any optimization you can think within your process that focus on a single uh, plugin development? I explain a little bit what was the choice to have multiple uh, uh, environment, uh, multiple plugin environments uh, rather than focusing on one single yeah. plugin? Um, the, the background is that in my uh, research i'm using the static analysis and code coverage so one of my topics and these plugins uh, depend on a lot of other plugins so in order to measure the code quality uh, between my current change and the or in the pull request i need to make some delta computations so i need to make one build which is which i call the reference build and one build, which is the actual build, I'm inspecting the pull request, and I want to see how many new warnings we have from this build to the reference build. And in order to compute this reference build, I need another plugin. And therefore, all these elements I need in my daily work are part of this uh, setup. So if a student wants to improve the warnings plugin, uh, the student uh, needs more than one plugin. Even the static analysis plugin is divided into two plugins, the warnings plugin, which is, uh, let's say, a Jenkins dependent, and the uh, analysis model plugin, which actually parses the warnings, is uh, independent of Jenkins because I'm also using it in a GitHub action without Jenkins. So therefore, I also need two projects. And one comes after the other so it, i ended up in with 10 projects or i think it's seven projects now but if you want to set it up for a different tool like git you yeah maybe in git you also if you want to develop the git plugin you also need git and client git client plugin and maybe some additional ones as well so i think jenkins development if you are getting a little bit deeper, it's not so simple that you just need one plugin. You need more than one plugin, and therefore I bundled a lot of them. Uh, not a lot, but those that I need. Uh, just a, a small question about uh, yeah. the Docker installation that raised quite some interest. Uh, yeah. How are you handling the required credentials? Mm -hmm. using configuration as code or another yeah. yes focus, uh, focus. It's, uh, it's uh configuration as code let's switch to the screen so i have these keys so basically the agent and the controller are talking using ssh and i encoded these keys uh, here in the yaml file uh, which is something you should never do in a productive environment but yeah for here it's just fine and so here is the key and i'm setting up the agent with this key and this helps me to something which is very important when you are developing in this distributed environment i have uh, a debugger port open for the controller and a debugger port opened for the uh, for the agent that means if students change the code in jenkins they can have uh, this uh, re remote debugger attached and then they actually see the code stopping when the agent uh, is hitting a breakpoint they see where they are actually uh, in the code and they can inspect the agent running and the in they can inspect the controller running and these are let's uh, make it a little bit smaller so um, these runners I have uh, shown in the beginning, we have one agent remote debugger and one Jenkins controller remote debugger. So when I start these uh, runners, um, they you see they are connected and they do nothing else. So when I'm now have looking at the user interface of Jenkins, I can, or I can, yeah, let's stop Jenkins here right in the middle. And then you see, uh, okay, where I am somewhere in the Jenkins controller. 
and I can do the same thing for uh, let's say one moment um, when I start the same runner from the agent then you can debug uh, the uh, agent code and typically my warnings plugin uh, is running on the agent where the warnings are actually passed and then the in elements are put back to the controller and then I can see on the agent if everything is working and on the controller if everything is working. So and, in, inside and, this single IntelliJ instance that you're running, you've got it talking to a debugger on the agent and talking to a debugger on the controller so yes. that if you hit a breakpoint in either location, you get notified in your in IntelliJ. Yes, that is fine. And this is really important because otherwise you're always guessing. And I, I see a lot of students say, where can I put my Swiss out and why is my Swiss out not showing? Yeah. And yeah, here you can have real debugging on the agent and on the controller. Yeah, so you're showing your students how to do multi-process, multi-computer de debugging and diagnosis from inside mm -hmm. the familiar world of their IDE. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's very nice. Very nice. And the last thing which uh, is here is also some convenience uh, because I'm a little bit lazy. <laughs> so when you want to change your plugins, you need to deploy these plugins to your Jenkins instance. So there was I'm, a question that interests uh, yeah. uh, Christoph uh, about that. So go ahead. Uh, OK, uh, um, actually, we deploy what I'm not using, I must first say I'm not using Ma a Maven uh, HPI run because this is not working as I need it. So I'm deploying the plugins by building them on the command line and copying them into the Docker container and then restarting the Docker container. So okay. this is uh, when you use one of these scripts, it will done for you automatically. So it basically is a script which goes on the console, root calls Maven install. Then it has a deletes the old plugin from the Docker container, copies the new plugin to the Docker container, and restarts the Docker container. So it's simple, but if you're doing it always on the command line, you sometimes you think get you bored need to or it. sorry, I did not ask you. That. No, no, you get bored or you yeah. you, yes. you you do a typo and then everything's yeah. broken. Yeah. A very, a very neat and very interesting procedure. So let's see. Uh, ah, OK, in the middle, and now the, the, the actual instance now finished, <laughs> it's starting. So um, if we want to see the results, then we can uh, jump into these. Uh, yeah projects and yeah, it's still slow on my machine um, so you can have a look at the warnings plug in and typically you can also get now breakpoints and if you want to have a breakpoint um yeah i did not prepare it one because it's now a little bit late in the hour uh, i think we need to keep a little bit focus on the time but you can debug everything by switching back to IntelliJ and, and you see here the controller is still running, the agent is still running. So everything is under your control and it simplifies the development of such a complex infrastructure in Jenkins. So this is basically everything I wanted to show. So maybe we can have a little there bit are, more focus on questions. Yeah, there, there is one question here from uh, Martin, uh, a more general question. Which language do students use for plugin development? Uh, Java, Groovy, a mixture? Only, we only use Java. I'm not aware that anybody in the Jenkins universe is using something <laughs> different than Java because Java is just working. And I think all plugins are using Java. 
Now, now, while you say Java, there's a lot of JavaScript in the Warnings Next Generation plugin. Is that a complication for you? How, how have you been able to deal with JavaScript and the Java world that, that Jenkins involves? I assume your students get involved in JavaScript also? Yes. Uh, actually, the user interface of the Warnings plugin, the refreshment was made uh, by a student. And she uh, created this uh, in in her um, bachelor thesis. And a lot of students uh, are working on the front end side in their companies where they are working besides the students, uh, besides. Uh, and yeah, I think it, it's still easy to add JavaScript on the individual pages of a plugin. It's a little bit more complicated if you want to show your new user interface in a page which is used by several plugins in Jenkins. For instance, the job view, let's see. Um, also this view is totally under control of my plugin. So I'm using here Bootstrap and I'm using eCharts uh, and I'm using data tables here uh, to use a different user interface as other plugins. But when you get on the, the build page, for instance, this page, yeah, here it's a little bit more complicated. And if you're getting to the uh, top level view, yeah, now it's just one build, though you see no trend charts, but this page is subdivided by several plugins. So it's a little bit more complicated to use JavaScript in here. But in an ideal Jenkins world, I would like to have these scripts I'm using in my plugins basically on top level of Jenkins. So everybody can use Bootstrap out of the box without configuring it a little bit strange currently. I have one question about the VM yeah. uh, that you provide the students. Is that a hosted VM that they get to use or are they expected to have the hardware to be able to run that VM? Um, they have are expected to have the runware, uh, the hardware on their own machines. So we are using an Ansible script to create the virtual machine. We are deploying the, the image uh, on our uh, university uh, cloud you know, location, and the students can get it from there. But then they, are, they need to have a computer that runs virtual box or which, yeah, VMware so, or whatever. So what kind of specs do they need in order to be able to run this successfully? Run. Actually, we use, uh, it's just, uh, I think it's the, I have four gigabyte of memory uh, requirements for the virtual machine and one CPU, uh, and it is already working for them. Uh, sometimes when they want to have UI tests uh, with Jenkins, uh, uh, and then we have Docker in Docker, then it's getting, complex and slow. As you see on my machine today, if you're running too many applications in parallel, you need a new laptop. <laughs> now, we, we got a question in, in chat related to, is there a local versus server profile that you would consider um, for development? When I see what you're doing, it looks like you're doing what I think of as server profile anyway. Is there are there other things you might consider for cloud-based agents or something, or has, has your development environment worked well, even though many of your users are deploying to cloud or Kubernetes environments? Um, actually, those, uh, uh, those parts I, I've never used yet. Even in my, uh, yeah, the problem is that I'm now almost at 10 years in university and I'm not uh, in any, business project anymore, which is now using every different technology. So actually I'm using it still in this old school, let's say, uh, environment. Well, but but have your, you certainly have thousands of users of the Warnings NG plugin. There are yeah. thousands, probably tens of thousands by now of users of that. Have you had cases where you've had to diagnose problems that were uniquely cloud centered or your environment has been able to let you diagnose any problem reports already? Okay, yeah. I think uh, I can uh, diagnose these projects with my setup, um, but some problems just occur if they are in a cloud uh, instance. For instance, uh, the 
uh, code coverage API uh, transfers the source code from the agent to the controller, which works quite well if you are, have an agent which is right near your server instance. And, but if you are using it in a cloud instance, it's uh, really slow if you all transfer all your source code uh, highlighted. But this is something, yeah, you, you actually don't need to have a setup to uh, reproduce. You, you can see the timings of the bug report and then you can think about it. So my plugins are not so complicated that they you, you need to use these complex setups. Thank you. Now, do you envision that the setup you've got might be usable for someone who is beginning in Google Summer of Code, for instance, maybe they're evaluating project ideas. Is this something that a relatively new person to the project could do, or do they need to be one of your students in your classroom to, in order to comprehend it? Oh, no, this is, I think, uh, this would be a, a quite an easy task for someone else, uh, for instance, Google Summer of Code. So hmm. I think it's not really uh, hard to understand what uh, I've done here. It's just a little, a lot of work it was, <laughs> but uh, now when it's now running, you can just, yeah, it's kind of a search and replace. Uh, you need to replace some modules and you need to make a Maven module a Maven multi-module, but this is yeah not really complicated. And I now, think, uh, oh, go ahead. No, sorry. The only part which is a little bit more complex is the Docker setup uh, because it was a hard time to get it with the ports and the uh, communication, but that's working now. You can inspect the controller on in IntelliJ as well, the file content. So yeah, this is okay, but the rest is, I think, simple. So winding a little bit back to Darren's question, one of the places we're considering is we're about to embark on the She Code Africa Contributhon. And as part of that, I'm worried that are, if I told them, hey, you need to use this virtual machine, is it going to be bigger than the machine that they've got available to host it? So mm -hmm. you said you run in a four gig virtual machine and that's enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. mostly, yeah. But um, when, it, I always say to students, it's it's better if you can run it on your own machine, uh, of course. Uh, but right. to, uh, then I, it's <laughs> it takes normally two weeks be before it works on their own machine. So uh, it was easier for me to have this virtual machine, which they are using in every other class. Um, mm -hmm. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Especially if you are using windows and docker you know it's uh oh, it. it's not always working as you want it <laughs> no wait a second here. those of us those of us who love windows that, that that's uh, windows <laughs> is my preferred platform i don't know what you're saying <laughs> no, okay sorry <laughs> that's <say> great <laughs> Well, Uli, thank you so much. We're we're approaching our end time. Thank you, thank you. The, the yeah, recording, yeah. The, I'm looking forward to reviewing it again, looking at your your Docker definitions, yeah. and you should expect change, pull requests coming from me to think about how can I help contributors to things that I maintain use your yeah. technique. And maybe Several compliments to in the chat. Okay, and what if there are present. questions, uh, after the meeting, I think we can use the community or the Gitter channels, uh, how people would like to use. Great. Thank you, Uli. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Sarah Mark. Thanks, Darren. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we'll post the recording to the um, meetup page shortly. So thanks all, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.